producer and publisher for Fresh Ink Group. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Voice of Indie podcast, show number 57. I am your host, Beam Weeks, and with me, as usual, is my co-host, Stephen G. How are you doing tonight, Stephen? I'm just fine and dandy. How are you doing? I'm just dandy and fine. See how I did that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been a pretty good week. We had the remnants of the hurricane came through, dump, dump a whole lot of water, and then move on. And now it's beautiful outside and in the 70s. So I'm going to enjoy this evening when we get off the air. All right. Now, you know, uh, Hello Chattanooga uh, went into pre-sale this week. It's going to be released officially in a couple of weeks. That's the book by uh, newscaster, journalist, radio personality, Chattanooga Denizen, David Carroll. And uh, it's a 710-page book, beautiful book, full of color pictures. We're just having all kinds of fun with it. David went out there and uh, did some public appearances and sold out of his first shipment already and has already ordered $13,000 worth of additional copies for him to take to events. So we had to spend some time on the phone today making arrangements for an 18-wheeler full of truck, full of books to get into his neighborhood and wow. had to arrange a hand cart in order to get him up his driveway and all that. So. Uh, yeah, we like to complain about selling so darn many books. We got to order a hand truck in order to get them from one place to another. <laughs> yeah, well, that's you know that's a good thing to uh, to to be able to brag about. Um, oh, yeah. I wanted to say a quick little thing. Uh, one of our regular listeners, Verwain Greenhall, uh, he's uh, not going to be in the audience again this week. Uh, his wife has been having some uh, medical issues and. Uh, she's taking kind of a uh, wrong turn, so he's up at the hospital with her and just want everybody to, you know, keep him in your thoughts and in your prayers, and uh, we hope to have him back in the audience, both he and Lisa, uh, him and Lisa, uh, pretty soon, so. Hang in there, Verwain and Lisa. We need you back in the audience soon. All so, right. We've been... We've been kind of curious, listeners, about, uh, you know, if any of you out there are actually paying attention to the show. And we do notice the numbers that come up on Blog Talk Radio, which is our primary host here. And we see the numbers, you know, going up uh, each week, a little bit more respectable each time. And, you know, we're kind of pleased with how it's going. Well, in the last couple of days, we got a little bit more serious about the analytics and went looking to see what kind of listenership we're getting through the website, podcast tabs, and Spotify and places like that, and and started coming up with some interesting numbers. What what did you find out there, Beam? Well, the interesting thing is most people, when they listen in the archive, they're actually listening through the freshinkgroup.com website. Um, we've got a, a you know a, a, an audio player, video audio video player. Even though the videos are posted on YouTube, when you watch them on the site, it doesn't register on YouTube. It registers through our video audio player on freshinkgroup.com. And then second, it, uh, it's Blog Talk Radio, people going back to Blog Talk Radio and uh, listening to the old episodes there as well. But that also combines the live listens. And then finally, YouTube, that's the third most popular out of the three. Now, uh, StephenG's.com has the audio player as well, I believe. And But there's we don't have a, a, a way to find those numbers out yet. We, I think that has to be coded in there to find those numbers. But uh, some interesting things. You would think, okay, we had uh, Mark Herndon and his lovely wife, Leah Seawright, on. Now, Mark, is an, he's a known name. He's probably the, the biggest name that we've had on here, having played drums for uh, Country Music Hall of Fame band Alabama for 28 years. Uh, his listens have been, they're at 112 right now, 112. Now, this is, you know, a few weeks after uh, he's been on the show, and they go up each week. All of these go up each week. Uh, but just letting other people, Authors know when they come on, you may not be that big a name, but you're still going to get listens. Dick Ferrer Jr., he wrote a book about the construction company that his father and two other guys started, and uh, he's got 317 listens to his show, to his episode. That's pretty now, good. Robert, yeah, now Robert Williscroft, he's been on, he's a two-time guest. Uh, his first uh, um, episode that he was on 
that's currently sitting at 379 listens. And his most recent one, a few weeks back, uh, 89. And like I said, each of these go up, you know, as, as the weeks go on. Uh, Ron Yates, he was one of our earliest uh, guests. I think he was on show number three, if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, he's currently sitting at 507 listens. Uh, another two-time uh, guest, the brother, uh, brother, the father and son rock band, Wide Track. Their first uh, appearance is currently sitting at 414 listens, and their second one at 250. So they were quite popular. And then uh, Verwayne Greenhoe, he was, we had him on some time ago, and he's sitting at 364 listens. Now, we have some that are getting close to 1,000 listens, and we have some that are just getting started with 20 listens. Uh, we have some that are in, in like 800, eight, I think 800 and, and like 58 is the most listens. And I just went through and grabbed some of these, uh, some of these numbers just to, to you know, let other people know, hey, if you're a guest on this show, you don't have to be that big name. You're still going to get some numbers. Now, I have no way to figure out what our, our – totals are on Spotify. I've been looking, trying to find where I can count those, those lessons. Um, but I may have to pay for, uh, you know, one of those upgraded accounts to be able to see, see who's listening or at least how many people are listening over there. Uh, but I know we're getting, uh, we're getting listens over there because I hear from people saying, yeah, they listen on Spotify. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, total, we've got over 12,000 listens just on the freshingroup.com site for all of the guests. Uh, and listen, we're trying to build this. Next year, it would be nice to say, hey, we've got 100,000 listens. And, uh, you know, you as listeners, if you enjoy the show, spread the word, share share the link, get this out on social media, invite people in to listen on Wednesday nights, and uh, let's grow this thing and make it big. Yes, our, our uh, marketing social media guy, uh, our 17-year-old Sam, He's out there actively promoting these old shows every week, too. He's posting them. He's putting out those placards, listen to a classic show. He's putting them in the newsletter each week and looking for places to keep getting it out there. We're also noticing that if you Google an author's name, who uh, and it's somebody who has been on our show, our show is popping up on that first page in almost all cases, which is a really good sign. That means Google's starting to recognize interest in the show and the, the amount of traffic that it's getting, too. So it's a building process. If you come on the show and you're a guest, we might only get you 100 uh, listeners while you're actually on the show. But over time, we're shooting for 100,000. And it's going to yeah. take some time and some effort and a lot of effort and a little bit of money and expense and whatnot. But, again, we're trying to build a library here, not just of live shows, but of archived shows that people will go back and listen to for years to come. Yeah, and I think the thing that when I was uh... – Kind of combing through all these numbers, the thing that really surprised me was that the freshingroup.com site is the main source that people are going to for the the uh, the older episodes because, as you said, Sam is out there promoting those old episodes, but he's usually promoting them on YouTube, you know, trying to mm-hmm. build the YouTube channel, uh, and yet most people are still kind of navigating over to the website. So that's kind of cool if we can get yeah. all of them up to that same level. We'll be rocking and rolling. Yeah, the nice thing about the website is if you click on that podcast tab, that's all that's there is our podcast. If you go to the YouTube channel, that's you know our trailers, our audio books, all that stuff's all mixed into one big old pot. So you got to kind of look through the stuff to find all the different podcasts or the particular author you want. But those podcast tabs sure make it easy, and there are that's all that's there, and they're in order, ready to go with a picture of the person who's the guest. So get on over there. Help us with those numbers. All right. Now, we've got an author for you this week. I know, I know. You're you're kind of weird for us to have an author on the show, but his name is Michael Lines. He's a good guy. Uh, I've known him for about six years now, I think, and I think Beam's known him for a few years longer than that. But uh, we've got a bio, and Beam's about to read it for you. All right. Michael Lines is an award-winning author of the Blood series, which so far has won the new Apply Literary Indie Bragg Medallion, Reader's Favorite for Fantasy, and most recently, the Ian Book of the Year Selection for Fantasy. 
Mr. Lyons was awarded a BSEE degree in electrical engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology and currently works as an embedded software engineer. He has four sons, has been married for more than 30 years, and currently lives with his wife and youngest son in the beautiful secluded hills of Sussex County, New Jersey. And uh, with that, welcome to the show, Michael. It's good to have you here. Well, thank you very much, Beam, and thank you very much, Stephen. Hey, it's good to good now, to be here. Yeah, now good to have you, you. you. Yeah, you <laughs> live you live in New Jersey now. Uh, is this where you're originally from? Dude. Yes. Yeah, I'm a I'm a New Jersey native. I'm a lifer. All right. Kind of a I was born, born, kind of born in, in Madison, New Jersey, and uh, and now I live in Sussex County, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah, you, we usually when we think of New Jersey, I think of Bruce Springsteen or Bon Jovi. Or Chris <laughs> yeah, Christie. Yeah. Or Chris or Christie. Chris Christie. Yeah. There, there you go. Uh, as or we Atlantic like to call him, Krispy Kreme Christie. <laughs> or Atlantic <laughs> City. Uh, but yeah, that's that's that, that, that's a nickname. But uh, um, yeah, actually, the funny thing is, my sister lives in the same town as as John Bon Jovi used to live in. Uh, that was Rumson, and now uh-huh. I think he's he moved out and she moved out. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of there's quite a few famous folks and mobsters that come from Jersey. More mobsters, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so what uh, what kind of kid were you, Michael? Were you a reader and a writer, or did you get out there and be involved in activities and didn't discover the written word till later, or uh, what, where can we start putting the blame? I was a big a big reader. Uh, I have to blame uh, my mom uh, because she was an English major. My dad was an engineer, and my mom was an English major. And um, I kind of went, if you will, both ways. I, I was always a good, um, you know, always, always really in, interested in books and, and in reading. And I had all my, you know, my favorite genres. I, I, I loved Tolkien and fantasy. I loved Holmes and, and Agatha Christie and the Hardy Boys and all those other, you know, all the youthful uh, books. I have a huge, uh, I'm sitting in the middle of the, my, part of my huge collection of paperbacks. They're just like, you know, falling all around the room here in the office. And uh, so I'm a big was a big reader before I ever wrote a word, but uh, I always did enjoy a writing. And the first time I ever started to write, I, I felt very confident and comfortable, uh, you know, putting my thoughts down on paper. Part of of uh, of becoming a good writer is to ingest and sort of absorb good writing from other good authors and people that you en- that you enjoy. And I think you find that that it gives you. Um, Something to pattern yourself after. You're certainly not copying them, but you're you're patterning you're patterning yourself after your your author heroes, if you will. Well, yeah, you're you're not going to sit down to write a book having never you know write a novel having never read a novel. Like a filmmaker's not well, going to decide to make a film though they've never watched a movie before. It's you're, you you're say influenced that, but, by but, it. You you say that, but I've I've read some people who who it would appear that that that's what they did. <laughs> yeah. I've got now I've got a, a Kindle book. full of stuff like that. Yes, yeah, so so I mean that's that's very charitable, but it's not the truth. <laughs> There's quite a well, few people who seem to to engage in this activity without having first done a little re- a little reading. <laughs> yeah, I think you know. Or comprehend. Yeah, or total or total agreement. Uh, I think. Uh, as as writers you you read and you're influenced by i've got influences that from all kinds of people uh from stephen g's to you know barbara king solver yeah. to stephen king you know yeah they, there's just something that they've written that a way a certain way that they write it that hey i like that you know and i maybe weave that into a short story or something here and there not like you said yeah. not taking what they wrote but just the way they they write something the way they construct a sentence or something like or dialogue or whatever oh yeah dialogue exactly you find somebody who writes good dialogue and you just you know you go to school on them if you will yeah uh, yeah that's exactly um now you received uh a an electrical engineering uh degree from stevens institute of technology uh what about earlier yes. school Elementary, junior oh. high, high school. Uh, I went, were you I went, writing? I went to all those. Yeah. <laughs> were, were you writing back then? Uh, writing, Even in Jersey, wow. In, Even in Jersey, we we have schools. Uh, yeah, um, 
Well, certainly, you know, uh, in school we we did um, writing assignments and that sort of thing. I wouldn't say though I was I was writing anything for publication, but um, I did have a, a a Catholic school education, uh, which means it was nuns and and discipline and a lot of uh, a lot of rules. Uh, but I will I will credit them for uh, you know instilling the grammar and instilling. Um, proper use of the language and a good vocabulary. One thing you'll also get from doing a lot of reading is you'll get a big vocabulary. And it's incredibly important if you're trying to express something which requires a little, you know, a little fine touch or a little subtlety to have enough words in command and that you know what they mean and how to use them uh, to kind of get your thoughts across. Because, you know, the written word is a terrible medium. It's, you've got nothing. You've got no pictures. You've got no sound. You've got, no, you got to do everything on the page and put it in the other person's imagination. And that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a task, as we all know. That's the challenge. Yeah. It's, it's that? you know, uh, um, you talk about having a big vocabulary from reading. You have to paint pictures with these words and uh, the good ones yeah. can do it. It's, it's very, it's, it is very difficult. And I think that you, you, you do this a lot, Beam. And I, and I, I know, I'm not sure if, if you do Stephen as well, uh, you know, write the short story, the short form. And, and that's, uh, I think a higher art because it's harder to do. Okay. Um, I'm, I, there's a comment here on, uh, on Twitter from Robert Willistroff. He says, my sympathies for having been in New Jersey all your life. I lived there for a year myself a long time ago. <laughs> well, we, you know, and, and we were speaking a little bit before the show um, amongst ourselves, but I'll say that Jersey, it, it, we, we get a bad rap uh, because of New York and because of, you know, Trenton and all and the cities. And uh, that's true. None of that uh, take none of that away from Jersey. It's all true. And and you know the corridor of, of I ninety five is a terrible place to be. But where we are, where where I live, is the rural part of New Jersey, and it's cow country and farms and truck farms and you know vegetables. And we're just coming into harvest right now. So uh, where we live is is much more like um, you know much country, much more country than it is anywhere if you get close to the city. All right. I think it's time to play a commercial, Beam. All righty. Hello, Chattanooga. Hello, Chattanooga. Famous people who have visited the Tennessee Valley. Features photos, stories, and complete listings of the entertainers, athletes, political leaders, and others who visited the area since 1900. Chattanooga has attracted some of the best-known celebrities in the world, thanks to our city's historic venues, beautiful scenery, and powerful people. Hello Chattanooga features hundreds of restored photos, behind-the-scenes stories, and thousands of fully indexed entries spanning more than 700 pages. I'm David Carroll. I've worked in Chattanooga television and radio for more than 40 years. I also write a weekly newspaper column and have written two other books, Chattanooga Radio and Television, a photo history of Chattanooga media, and Volunteer Bama Dog, a TV guy's love letter to the South, a collection of my most popular stories. Hello Chattanooga is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group in a keepsake, jacketed, hardcover edition with full-color interior printing, soft cover with black and white photos, and all-color ebook formats worldwide. Take a trip back in time, enjoy great memories, and maybe even settle an argument as you learn the dates and places that your favorite star, athlete, or president visited the Chattanooga area. All right, cool. You want to catch that uh, episode that uh, David Carroll was on? Uh, it's in the archive. Now, I yep. lost Twitter a little bit ago, Beam, so if anything's happening over there, you need to stay on it. I've, every time I All go right. back to it, it's just spinning and saying, site not available. I don't know why that All is. Right. Oh, my goodness. I've got it. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, there, there's a the man, uh, uh, David Carroll, who has quite a nice voice. Yeah, yeah he does that for a living. <laughs> he does that for a living. You can tell he does that for a living. <laughs> he He sounds good. <laughs> yeah. He's got those golden pipes. He's got the golden pipes, which I wish I had, but and then I'd have a different career. <laughs> so tell us about your family, Michael. You're married? 
I am married. Uh, Margaret and I met actually at Stevens Institute of Technology. She was also uh, pursuing a, a, a technology degree. Uh, she was more in, the, in biomedical engineering, and, and I was in, in more electrical, if you will. And, um, you know, we got married right out of college. Uh, we had our first son a year later, and uh, we never looked back. And uh, we've been married. It was 1983, so it was a while ago, you know. Uh, and uh, we came and moved up here to our to our the same house we're in now today in in eighty five so we've been up here quite a long time and now all the kids have you know they're all off and, and doing their own thing uh so uh, we're we're uh empty nesters if you will hmm. so you were electrical engineering and she was bioengineering so you team up biomedical did you build, yes did you team up and build a cyborg <laughs> no. <laughs> oh no! You, See, that would have been a cool story. That would have been a cool story. Well, I, I, and you I, got I, loose. Did you just I, violate I, well, your NDA beam? <laughs> there you go. Don't don't do that. Uh, the uh, you know I do really do enjoy science fiction, and that's some of my real uh, muse, if you will. So I've written quite a quite a few short science fiction stories, and people keep asking me to to write um, a longer one, and I I, I plan to, uh, but the. Um, uh, right now, I've been the the current story I'm working on, which we'll get to later. But the current story I'm working on is is a command performance, if you will, from the, the mom I mentioned earlier, who was the English major who got me started in all this. So, all right. Um, now, when you're not writing, uh, just kind of yeah. hanging out, do you have any hobbies or interests? How do you spend your your time? Sure. Uh, my son, my oldest son actually lives fairly close to us within five or six miles. And so we do a lot of uh, working on cars together. Uh, he very recently, we, we keep all of our cars going and we have a, a collection of, of uh, Volkswagens and Audis and that sort of thing. Uh, but he just, uh, this is a, a, an anecdote, if you will, he just bought a, a Porsche from 2001 that needs oh. a lot of work. <laughs> so we're going to be doing a lot of that. And, uh, you know, I, I do enjoy, um, uh, you know, doing things around the house. I spent almost all last winter uh, kind of uh, putting a um, – preparing my house to be sided, and I'm having somebody do the actual, you know, finished work. But I did all the all that work. So I do a lot of carpentry. Uh, I do a lot of, um, uh, you know, cooking. I love to cook. I love to bake things. So I, I, keep, I keep myself busy. And, of course, we have the three grandchildren, so they, uh, they keep us busy too. Now I noticed something there with the uh, with the automobiles, uh, Volkswagen, Audi, yeah. and uh, Porsche. These are all German. Yep. Is that is that by design? Is this what you specialize in working on German automotive? Well, we have all the tools for them. So I think I think you're you would you wouldn't be wrong. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, my son started with the Volkswagens and then he says, well, we have all the tools for them now. So we do kind of try to stay in a, uh, in a family of cars, if you will, because every, every, you know, every manufacturer has their own idiosyncrasy. So we probably understand those the best, but we'll fix anything. Okay. <laughs> He's an engineer too, my eldest son. He also went to Stevens. Okay. Um, so what? So what's your dream car? Oh gosh, you know I like Italian cars. I I I would buy you know one of these new Alphas, uh, new Alfa Romeos. They look ter they look terrific. But I don't know if I can convince my son that we can fix it. We can fix an Italian car. I had a lot of Italian cars uh, when I was younger. The first car I ever bought was a Lancia Beta Coupe, uh, which was basically a glorified Fiat. And uh, uh, then I had a an Alfa Romeo GTV6. Well, these were all very very old cars, and we had a Saab, and we had we, we we've we've always had all kinds of cars to to work on. But I do like the Italian cars. They're they're fun. Hmm. Now I did pull up Twitter on my phone since I can't get to anything else through this uh, computer here. Uh, none of the websites yeah. are accessible right now, although Blog Talk Radio is working. Robert Willis Cross says, yeah. for what it's worth, down the road from me in New Jersey was a junkyard. On one side was a sign, <laughs> we buy junk. On the other side was a sign, we sell antiques. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's just good marketing now, isn't it, Stephen? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we buy junk and we sell antiques. Uh, I, 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 could, I could subscribe to that. Okay, Michael, so... You, so 
Go, Go ahead, ahead. Stephen. I was going to say, you want to play another commercial and then uh, hassle Michael some more? Sure. All right. <laughs> this one is uh, your choice, ABCs or Legacy? Let's do uh, Legacy of Danger. That's the new one. Okay. Then this, then this listeners, is the worldwide, uh, in fact, in the entire solar system, premiere of a new promo for Patricia A. Guthrie's Legacy of Danger, which Fresh Ink Group is republishing in the next week or two. Elena Dacani inherits her family's castle in Romania, a land dipped in myths, folklore, and the legendary Walking Dead. The local proverb serves as a warning. Do not speak badly of the devil, because you cannot know to whom you will belong. When she's attacked by an international assassin, only her deceased husband and her ex-boyfriend's live presence can protect her on her journey to the mountainous region of Transylvania. But that's not the only problem troubling Elena. Who is that boy invading her dreams? And what really happened to a priceless gem-crusted silver cross buried by an earthquake in the 15th century? Who's stalking Elena? Who wants her dead and why? Legacy of Danger by Patricia A. Guthrie is a paranormal romantic thriller with a deep mystery and plenty of suspense. It'll haunt you in jacketed hardcover, softcover, and all ebook formats worldwide. Legacy of Danger by Patricia A. Guthrie is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. All right. Yeah, that's a good one. That, 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 that has a little of everything in it. There's some romance, there's some paranormal. There's some thriller and mystery and just a lot of really cool stuff. Good story. And for those of, those of you who subscribe to the newsletter, you know, the form on the home page at freshinkgroup.com, by about next week's newsletter, you should be able to see the video that accompanies that commercial. Yeah. So, Michael, uh, what I was uh, leaning towards before the commercial was uh, um, – you know, how long have you been writing? When did you get serious about writing? Um, well, that would be where you tw- thought uh, twenty fifth. Uh, well, that would be uh, in about uh, twenty. Let's say, probably about twenty ten, actually. And uh, it was uh, on the occasion of, um, uh, you know, it was one of the anniversary occasions of the the uh, passing of my son Christopher, who who died when he was seven. And um, he he had suffered from from leukemia, childhood leukemia, and uh, I got, I'll say, um, uh, a, a task from him. He, he wanted me to basically write a memoir, and uh, I was going to get it together and have it published uh, basically on the on the um, 20th anniversary of of his passing, which was he was he passed in. Um, in 1994. So uh, that was the beginning of, of this journey. And, and it took a long time to write that. The, and and it maybe uh, you guys have the same sort of experience. The very first time you go to write a book, uh, in, this, in this case, an, a memoir, uh, it takes a long time because you have to kind of feel your way forward and do a lot of reading and rereading. Uh, so that, that was almost a five-year effort where long periods of time would go where I just would put it to the side. You know. Yeah, um, but you, you then know, you, you get. I, I that's that I like you said. That's I think that's the case with a lot of of writers. Uh, jazz baby, from start to finish, from from beginning to publication was literally eight years. But there were yeah. a couple of years where it just sat, you know, in a drawer and I didn't touch it. So uh, that that was my first. But now they, you know, they become easier as you go along. They do, uh, and that's my my experience as well. Is that you? You ca- also kind of learn the ropes, uh, if you will. Both your own, you know, your, you you come into your own writing style. And this particular subject was difficult. It was um, cathartic. It was uh, I wanted to do Christopher justice, and I I wanted to tell his story in a in his. Um, this would be a narrative nonfiction. It was certainly nonfiction, but it was written in the form of a of a true narrative, a true story. And uh, so it it spans, you know, really uh, from his birth uh, to his passing. Uh, but the um, uh, you know, it's 
uh, as a as a story, it it talks about significant interludes. It's not a diary, uh, for argument's sake, which a lot of memoirs, unfortunately or fortunately, perhaps it just depends if you like them or not, is they become sort of um, sort of a day by day, blow by blow. Then this happened. Then this happened. Then this happened. And I didn't want to write a a book like that. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and it's interesting uh, you chose them, you know, to write a memoir about about your son. Um, I know I, mm. I was seeing an interview with uh, Anne Rice years ago, and she was talking about, you know, she had lost her daughter at six to leukemia, mm. and uh, the the character in her first novel, Interview with a Vampire, Claudia, she said that was her daughter. That was her her, her way of keeping her daughter alive. Uh, you yeah. Know, even though it was a vampire story, but to her, she said that's what she said. It was a cathartic healing process for her. Yeah, and that, and you know, that's another way of bringing people, uh, you know, into your writing that you know or you like to honor, and you don't necessarily have to say, "Well, this is about so and so." You just you know it yourself. You know, you know who you're writing about. Yeah. Steven, you there? Yeah, I've just verified my internet is completely down, and I cannot figure out how Blog Talk Radio is working when absolutely nothing else will with any of my three computers. My phone is disconnected from the internet now, but I'm still on the air. So hey, wow. everybody, you're, you're you're doing great so far. I'm don't the, don't don't curse don't curse it. Yeah, I'm the magic person here. Uh, yeah, so Michael. I mean, what what kind of what is your process like? I mean, do you write every day or only when you feel like it? Do you have certain times of the day, certain place that you you like to work? Burn incense, chant. Uh, how do you work? Well, no no incense, no chance. But I do like to write every day. I find that that habit works for me, and it it um it can be as little as a couple hundred words. But and I think over time, and I think you guys are, will, will say the same, is you get into a rhythm with a story, and you you find uh, one of my favorite authors was Roger Zelazny, uh, and he's a sort of a science fiction author. But he wrote a little bit about writing all the time as well, you know, the process. And one of the things that, that what I found evocative of the way he, he described writing is you know once you've you've driven the car, you've written the, you've written enough books, you know how to drive a car. You know when to accelerate, you know when to put it into the next gear, and you know how to drive, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And I, I think that that's very evocative. You, 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 in the beginning, like when you're learning to drive a car, you're, you're slow and you, you're careful and you don't know exactly how to get from here to there. And I think as you go along, practice, like anything, makes makes perfect. And so, yeah, now uh, my process is, is much uh, a more smooth. It's much more regular, um, uh, you know, than it, for argument's sake. Certainly, with there is a reaper, it was very irregular. But the other thing that's come to me over the over the years is I found that I can't. I, I do not enjoy plotting, and I think plotting. Uh, you know, people say, "Are you a plotter or a pantser?" I'm 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 much more of a pantser. You know, somebody who does things by the seat of their pants. Uh, you know, and I, I I work to an outline. I'll I'll say I'll I'll put my chapters out there. I'll put up chapter titles. I'll put up character bios. You know, in the beginning, I'll just to refer back to them. I'll write a little backstory, which may never come into the story, and then I'll just go. So let's go. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I I I have to outline things uh, myself. I I already know, like the current. I'm working on two novels right now, and and both of them I know exactly where they're going to go, and uh, I'm halfway through one of them, and. Uh, third of the way through the other one but i know where they're going to go uh and Mm -hmm. i write these things down because i have the idea for the story first from beginning to end and uh i just as i start to outline it i fill in the 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 bones and then when i sit down and actually write it i put the flesh on it but uh yeah so where do your story ideas come from we know uh there is a reaper we know where that came from but the Sure. The novels, the fiction. Where where do you get your ideas from? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the, the the most of the long fiction I've written, the long form fiction, novel form, started as a short story. So so it will be like you said, a germ of an idea. 
something which I can write um, from from beginning to end. So the fr- the second thing I wrote, um, if you will, was um, the Fat Man Gets Out of Bed, which was a collection of thirteen short stories, uh, and those those short stories. Uh, have acquired in many cases a life of their own. Uh, one of them was called It's in the Blood. And It's in the Blood turned into, if you will, the prequel novella uh, that, that, that became the Blood series. And so the, the original idea for this um, sort of uh, mashup, because that's what uh, the character Dev Callion is, he's a mashup of sort of anime. And sort of somebody who has a uh, sort of a wise guy kind of uh, of attitude about life and sort of a rebel and sort of an iconoclast uh, came from that original short story. And then I said, I like this character so much. and I like, you know, uh, what world I've kind of created around this character and what he was doing in that world. I said, let's just go for a, a, you know, a a novel. And and, uh, that turned into a very, you know, long – because fantasy, I think, I find – that genre likes a long story and the stories get long, you know, because you have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of scene versus just character. You can't just carry a fantasy on dialogue. You have to carry it with a lot of scene and a lot of, of, of innovative use of world building and so on. And then working all that in. So, uh, that, um, but it came out of short stories, which I, which are my first love. I really love the short form more than I love the novel. Yeah. Yeah, the novels. I mean, you got to be dedicated for the novels. Uh, those take a lot yeah. longer. Short stories. I can sit down and you know, in a in an evening, have a short story. You know, the rough draft of it done. Um, exactly. So those, I mean, those come um, quick. some of these some of, some of these um, anthologies that I've I've contributed to, uh, and I've contributed to a few of them. Uh, you'll say, well, you know, we need a short story. It has to be to give us a, a deadline. Uh, sorry, a, a, a word count. So let's no more than eight thousand words, at least a thousand. So I'll shoot for something in the middle of that, and I'll just take an idea and go go for it. And you know, you can you can rough it out in a couple of days. You can have a fully kind of fleshed story in a week or two, and then it's something you can look at and say, oh, this is nice, and you polish it up a little bit, and then you submit it. And that's that's a very satisfying way to write because you're done. <laughs> you, know, you start and you get through, you get through it and you're done. But it's also I think difficult because the short form requires you to have a full story, a beginning, a middle, and end, a plot arc, a character arc, and yet you have to do it in in a few thousand words or or, or you know no more than like ten thousand. And that's uh, I think it, it it sharpens you. You have to you have to really move through the story and get your point across uh, quickly. Yeah. Now, of these more than a dozen books that you have, uh, how many of them are available in audiobook? And boy, why would you do that? Yeah. Well, I, I would say uh, the second question is that audiobooks are are a, really a growing uh, marketplace, and people love them for lots of reasons. They, you know, they are hands free, if you will. Uh, they allow you to uh, put a, put another dimension on the story. And all of them, Stephen, are, are available in audio. I. I I started with, uh, you know, Audible, and um, the very first one I, I did, uh, the audiobook was there as a Reaper. Uh, we got a, 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 we found a very lovely man, a producer who we liked his voice, and we had a lot of talking with him about because it's a sensitive and it's a, uh, sometimes a, a, you know, a, a topic which people find a little bit um, challenging. So his, his name is Gerald Zimmerman, and he did a wonderful, uh, um, you know. Uh, rendition of there's a reaper um and that was the first audio book but then every other book i've i've done every other story i've done rather i re i released them uh after publication in in audio form and are they performing well for you they are uh i i'd say that of all the uh, of all the you know sort of sh- channels if you will uh for marketing the the books and the stories the audio books do the best uh, they're b- wow. both um, the most. They're the most lucrative, and they're also, uh, I think, the best sellers. And and maybe it's because, you know, if you if you write stories which require a little extra bit of, um, uh, you know, characterization, because I, I try to find producers who will put some life into the story. You know, not just read it in a dull and sort of dry way. Uh, and people enjoy them. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I like the audio books myself, although it's a funny thing. You, know, you guys have probably had this same experience. 
Uh, a funny thing is, is that the voice that your producer will put onto the character is nothing like the one you hear in your head. You're like, that's not his voice, you know? <laughs> and then you go, well, all right, well, that's that's what that's what that person hears in their head when they're reading your story, and it's it's an interesting insight, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, Beam, you want to roll our next commercial here? Uh, this one, coincidentally, would be about audiobooks. Okay. Multimedia publisher Fresh Ink Group is now producing audiobooks and video books. Publish your book and discover great books by Fresh Ink Group authors, always available in hardcover, softcover, and all ebook formats, and now expanding into audio and video books. Fresh Ink Group. Just wait till you hear what's next. Yeah, there you go. Boy, what a coincidence that was loaded up, huh? <laughs> what what a, what a what a segue that was. That was lovely. I'm telling you. <laughs> Barely so, coincidental. So, Michael, let's let's talk yeah. about your books now. You've you've mentioned there sure. is a reaper. It's called mm-hmm. There is a Reaper Losing a Child to Cancer, and that one was inspired by losing your, or leading up to losing your seven year old son. What can you tell us about that? Well, that's, I mean, um, succinctly, it was, as I mentioned, uh, Christopher really wanted his story uh, told. And uh, we released that book in 2015, which was basically the 20th anniversary of his uh, of his passing. And it's gone on to really garner a lot of um, really positive reviews. It's been, uh, uh, you know, a... Um, really inspiring and and comforting to a lot of folks who either have found themselves in similar situations or or at least um in relatable situations and we get uh we get Margaret and I both get um messages about there's reaper to this day you know uh, just the other day we got a a a a review from someone who had said that they basically it it pulled them out of depression or out of a depression that they'd been in for almost a year uh, after losing their child. So um, it's a it's an incredibly uh, rewarding thing to have out there. It was very cathartic. It was very difficult for us to write uh, because we we were we felt and shared very personal things. But uh, you know, people will have come to us and said, we you know we feel like we know you guys. You know, you feel like part of our family, if you will. And so it, it was. Um, it was, uh, I think, an important thing to do for him and for us. Yeah. Is it, um, is it pretty much just memoir, just telling the story, or do you have, uh, you know, information, advice, philosophy, anything, other kinds of things that you incorporated? Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't say there's there's philosophy. Um, there's certainly it is his story, but it is written in a narrative form. So there's a lot of characters in there. There's a lot of humor in it. Uh, people say that they find humor and they find and and we found it even in the actual experience. You know, you even in the darkest of moments, you have to bring your life and the living of it into it. And uh, Christopher's voice is throughout the story. Um, you know, and to the extent that he's in there, people uh, have gotten to know him who would have never had a chance to ever even meet him under any circumstances. So in one way, he's he's brought into the present day uh, through the agency of this of this story. Uh, but it, you know, it's it really is just his story, as I mentioned, from almost from the time he was born uh, to to uh, when he passed. And um, uh, it has uh, it's acquired a sort of a life of its own, which is we find very, as I said, very rewarding and gratifying. Yeah, I found it to be very meaningful, very poignant. Uh, I mean, it was there was no preachiness in there. You should look at things this way, or you should, you know, have that mm. kind of attitude or whatever. It was just laid it out, tell the story, and let people take it where they want. And and I thought it was just a wonderful tribute. And if that was the only thing you ever wrote, that still would have been a tremendous accomplishment. Oh well, thank you very much, Stephen. That's that's uh, that's high praise indeed. And it, it was done, you know, as a, a labor of love, if you will. Yeah, those are usually the best there, uh, mm-hmm. where your 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 heart is in it. It's not just well, I got to write a story, so uh, yeah. it's your heart is in it. 
Um, so who is yes. the who is the fat man, and why does he get out of bed? <laughs> yeah, well, this that's is a great collection point. of short stories. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's there's a, a a story about the fat man. You know, in essence, I'm the fat man who got a, who has to get out of bed. But I don't I don't I don't put myself into it in, in quite that literal of a form. Uh, but the 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 title, um, you know, was sort of something I just picked out of the air. But this, there is a titular story. There is the fat man. Uh, gets out of bed as as uh, I think it's it's near the middle of the book. It isn't it, it doesn't bring the it doesn't start off uh, with the fat man. But yet uh, each one of these stories uh, are in different genre. Uh, there's science fiction. There's um, sort of uh, uh, real realistic you know life realistic fiction. There's sort of fantastical elements in there. Uh, there is um, uh, always sort of a a germ of an idea, something I'm trying to get across. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed, um, you know, putting together that collection. I sort of set myself to, to writing uh, a baker's dozen of stories. And I, and I, I actually was going to thought about writing 16 of them, but I ended up with a baker's dozen because there were a couple that just ended up on the cutting room floor, if you will. And, um, you know, I, I have to mention, you know, for there as a reaper, we found a wonderful editor. His name is uh, Barry Shenkoff, and he's from the Chicago School of Editing, so he's a real sort of a classical uh, editor, and he did a wonderful job editing Reaper, and we've used him. I've used him in every other uh, work since, and so uh, Barry, uh, I have to credit him for keeping me cogent. <laughs> no. Now, you say you ended up with a baker's dozen. Did you write these with the idea of you're putting it together in a short story collection, or were these written for? Yes. You know. Okay. See, so, my, I've got two collections, written. and they were both of them were just I had gathered up, written so many of these short stories. Hey, let's put them in a collection. So. Yeah. Well, I, and the, and the other two collections I have are are more like that. You know, the ghost stories collections and the angel stories collections are really. Because I had a bunch of short stories and I wanted to organize them a little bit better into into the uh, into a uh, you know a form that somebody could buy a whole bunch. Sometimes people don't just like to want well they don't want just one short story. They want they want a whole yeah. cookie box of short stories. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, I, I literally said the fat man gets out of bed is going to be a collection of short stories again because I like the short form. I I find you know I, some of my favorite authors were short story authors uh, and really were. Um, a lot of them short story authors in science fiction and fantasy genres, but I wanted to do all, you know all the ones that I all the different genres that I like because I don't have a particular favorite. Uh, maybe science fiction is my my most favorite, but I I will um, I like to write in all kinds of different uh, styles and genre and yeah, different voices, yeah. different persons. Now you had mentioned there's a couple that a few that ended up on the cutting room floor. Uh, will you go oh, back yeah. and revisit them? Maybe I, I I I don't know how you guys organize, but I have a I have a laptop um, and I just have a folder which I call writing. And there's I don't know there's probably sixty stories in there in various forms of development. Um, you know the novels get their own kind of research department and they get their own folder and there's multiple folders underneath there. But many of these things are really just the beginning. Like I'll write down uh, a few paragraphs or a character definition or something like this. Well, would this this would be a cool thing to write about, and I'll just put it in there. And I'll go back and I'll look at it and say, well, that was interesting. Or, but but it is just sometimes it's so it's just a sketch, you know, just a yeah. a little sketch. So yeah, the cutting room floor is is the is the writing folder where things just sit and and I'll go back sometimes for inspiration uh, or I'll go back and and start to pick something like you guys have probably had this experience. Somebody says I have this anthology, I want you to be a contributor, and I need it in a week. And they're like, I, 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 I you know, I, so I go to the cutting room floor. <laughs> And I search around down there for something that doesn't have too that isn't too horrible. And I say, well, I can start with this, <laughs> you know, at least. I've done start that. With something. Yeah. yeah. And it works Mine, out. Mine's a work. It works mine's a works in progress folder, and it's you know I get yeah. this idea, oh, this would be a cool story, and so I'll start writing, it, and I might get you know four or five pages into it, and you know it's going to be a short story, and it's like, oh, okay, I got something over here, this other writing that I want to finish up. And I'll walk away right. from that. And sometimes the, before I realize that it, it's, oh, that was three years ago I started that one. Maybe I should look, you know, into finishing that. <laughs> I got a bunch of those. Yeah, exactly. 
but but those are those are good things because they're you as you say you put four or five six seven pages into it or maybe you'll put a, a chapter or two, and then you can you know, can go back to it and refresh yourself. So, uh, one of my favorite authors said says when I run out of ideas I go back and I plagiarize myself. <laughs> you know, yeah. and and, and basically he says, well, you know, I'm basically trying to um, rekindle the old idea from something I wrote maybe five or six years ago. Hmm. Now, over on Twitter, Robert Willis Croft is pointing out, tell him about Fresh Ink Group's music and sound effects. He's he's our uh, our pitch man today. Uh, yeah, these audio books oh. that we're producing, we're putting music bumpers in there, music in the background where appropriate, and uh, sound effects. And he's uh, nice. Mr. Willis Croft is very familiar with that because uh, a couple of his books have been submarine stories where we have to fill the, the audio book with sound effects from inside a submarine. Something we've become yeah, quite very, familiar with. That's cool. Yeah, that, that, adds a, that adds such a, a beautiful dimension. And I, I'll say that some of my audio books, the producer, particularly for the fantasy, um, does reverbs and he does uh, special effects as well. And I, I find it adds a dimension, which, you know, it's again, with, the, with just the printed word, you have to imagine all that. And uh, yeah. it is nice. Yeah. Okay, we got another commercial. This is for next week's guest, Tammy Trover. And this is about her book, The ABCs of Surviving Cancer. Cornelius is our cancer fighter. He's here to make our days much brighter. It's his job to help you know you're never alone wherever you go. Cornelius will guide and show you too. So let's fight the fire of cancer in you. A is for alive, that's what I am. This is my story and how it began. When cancer came in and changed my days, changed my thoughts, changed my ways. Hi everybody, my name is Tammy. And like so many of you around the world, I too am a cancer survivor. I wrote the ABCs of Surviving Cancer, alive, beautiful, and courageous, for people of all ages. My book is fun, informative, and most of all, heartfelt. It's a way to give confidence to young people, as well as families and friends, to educate those who know a young person facing the challenge of cancer, and to bring everybody together with empathy and understanding. This book is beautifully illustrated. The ABCs of Surviving Cancer guides us through the alphabet with a 16-line poem for every letter. Some of the topics include C is for Courageous, H for Hope, J for Joy, O for Own It, P for Patience, P for truth, B for victory, and Y for you. Join me in this journey of reassurance and understanding and share it with the people you love. The ABCs of Surviving Cancer is available in hardcover, softcover, and popular ebook editions such as iBook, Kindle, and Nook. Order yours through every major bookseller worldwide or through my website, TammyTrover.com. The ABCs of Surviving Cancer is proudly published by the Fresh Ink Group. That's next week's guest, Tammy Trover. She'll be on talking about that and a lot of other interesting things. And, of course, like all of these commercials you hear, if you'd like to see the video that goes with it, head on over to the YouTube channel or, rumor has it, uh, you can also find these in all of our websites. Now, uh, Michael, uh, mm. moving on to another short story collection, A Grave Business, Ghost Stories, collection book number one. What's this Ooh. about? 
<laughs> well, a great business is really really just a short story. Um, and the, the interesting thing, when I titled it a collection, I was saying, well, I'm just going to put out a bunch of short stories, ghost stories, and then you can just read them as you will. Uh, so they're really just short stories. But a great business is, is interesting uh, because it, it is a sort of a funny – light um set in the future the story revolves around a um a family uh the burroughs family uh who uh, uh basically has an undertaking business and uh the the problem with that undertaking business is that uh dying has gone out of style uh, and so uh <laughs> well it's in so fact uh, um, everybody's it's so doing passe it because Exactly. Every all, all people who die in this particular world um, use this uh, process, which in essence encapsulates their their essence in uh, in a computer. And so, no one actually. All the graveyards have been dug up. They've all been uh, they've all been kind of uh, turned turned into you know land that people can use because nobody needs them anymore. Well, um, the boroughs have the last quote-unquote graveyard on earth and it turns out that the the uh, spirits of the afterlife need graveyards for for themselves to you know to have a touchstone back into this world so that's what the story uh revolves around and it's there's some um you know funny little anecdotes if you will and a and a, a humorous way that it's all resolved in the end um uh, uh, and we find that the the the, uh, the spirits and the um and the technology uh, can can work together and uh, and actually coexist, and so uh, it was funny and it was well you know I, I was sort of well received and again as an audio book I found a a really good producer for it uh, and he did a nice job. Yeah, and it was only four months later after you released the Grave Business that you launched the Blood series, books zero, yes. one, two, and three, four book series so far. Well, and that's that's the end of it. it it's just it, it's a complete tr- trilogy. Although, as with every uh, a- any story, uh, you always leave a couple of things at the end. Where if you had to pick it up again, let's say uh, you take the same characters and move them, move that same world into a different uh, conflict and a different uh, different storyline, you can do it. Uh, so um, the Blood series is based on uh, the prequel novel. It's in the Blood, and its first book, book one, was called Destroyer's Blood. And uh, I picked on this, you know, the theme of, of blood in, and, and people thought, well, you know, it's, is, it a, is it a violent book? No, it's really not violent. It, it just has to do with all the different meanings of, of blood, blood being a, a way of, of talking about your relations, uh, you know, your, your, your relatives, if you will, your family. And this is largely um, a, a person uh, in, the, in the main character of Dev Kalyan who is a rebel uh, and sort of an iconoclast. Who um, doesn't like his family very much, and his family happens to be, in this case, the gods and goddesses of Olympus, and um, so it's got a, a sort of a, a Greek component, it's got a modern day component, uh, and it's got a sort of an urban fiction and urban fantasy component, if you will, and the mashup part of it is is the, the fact that Dev Kalyan, being an iconoclast, has sort of followed. Uh, you know he's kind of patterned himself again uh, after the samurai, and he's uh, he even though he was born uh, the son of a titan, he's he's very much um, uh, lives the style and the way you know the, the bushido, the way of the samurai. So I thought it was an interesting mashup between Greek mythology and Japanese uh, sort of anime and mythology, and so that plays out throughout the book. There's sort of tension between those two, um, and the multiple books. And then it, his, you know, the the conflict is with the the destroyer. The destroyer is actually a person or a personage, uh, who we find out later on is is a is a sort of an an old nemesis, if you will, of of part of his family. And so the the novel itself kind of runs it through runs through that conflict, but then it engenders another one, and that's where um, the second book in the series uh, comes out. And uh, uh, it, we work our way all the way up to, to uh, it's time for blood. Time for blood is where we find the ultimate villain, and that was uh, uh, released uh, last year, last November actually. So it took me about three, three and a half years altogether to get through that whole novel process. It was quite a, quite a slog. <laughs> now, but then, each of but these... then they're all collected into one book, right? 
Yeah. And as yes, I I I uh, did a an omnibus uh, edition with with all four, um, you know, the, with the novella, the prequel novella, as well as all four books. Uh, you know, uh, Destroyer's Blood, First Blood, and and Time for Blood, uh, into the Adventures of Dev Callion. And the interesting thing about the, the title, The Adventures of Dev Callion, is it, it really is it is his adventures, but the the strongest there are so many strong characters in this uh in this series that i would say um the female lead uh who um who really becomes who comes uh from the first book if you will and and also from the prequel novel, novella betrayer uh who is his sword to start with the female lead becomes i think uh, my favorite character of of the of the novels Well, it sounds like a good place to wrap it. I mean, you don't want to go to book five and bring in Cousin Oliver. Not, not that uh, very no, many people no, would rec- we're, we're, recognize that reference, but <laughs> yeah, we're, we're yes, we're we're done with with uh, with that particular uh, world for now, for now. But like yeah. I said, there's always always another way you can spin the next conflict. Yeah, and then you've Cousin got another Oliver. short story. <laughs> yeah, Cousin, Cousin Oliver. Uh, I'd be curious to see how many people out there got that reference. Yeah, if you're uh, listening, if, <laughs> if you get that, if you get that reference, listeners, type it in on Twitter. Cousin Oliver. Yeah. There you go. You might win Please a free a book. I'll, I'll, I'll send a free book to somebody who can explain the reference. But uh, Michael, <laughs> you you go. got a, you've got another uh, short story collection, Angel Stories, which sounds a little yes. bit different than the uh, ghostly dark kind of stuff. It is. Um, Angel Stories is, um, you know, there's a number of, of things that I've written over the years, which I would consider sort of, uh, uh, if you will, in the, in the paranormal, supernatural or, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, let's say the higher world kind of, 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 of perspective. And so I found that I had a bunch of them. And I thought, well, let me just pull them all together into into a collection called Angel Stories. So as Beam mentioned, these were stories that I had written for other purposes. Um, you know, uh, some of them were actually the republished stories from other collections or from other singular publications, you know, anthologies and so on, who released the book. You know, they released the story after they've had it out for a while, so then you can do what you, what you will with it. You retain the rights. So uh, that's where Angel Stories comes from. And uh, I, I, I particularly, I, li- I like some of those stories in particular. One of them is actually a continuation of of us after there is a reaper, and so it's a, again sort of a, a true story, a narrative nonfiction that we threw in there as well. Uh, so, it, and there's another one that was dedicated to my father called uh, My Father's Hands, um, uh, and uh, you know these are sort of personal stories that that are written in a in a in a non it isn't overtly saying, well, this is me, but, but people who know me or know my family would know that this is a story about us, but yet it becomes a, a, a narrative, not a narrative nonfiction that I just don't say to anybody. I say, well, you know, here's a story. And I think it, 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 it's written in a way that it's approachable, even if you have no idea who any of these people are. Hmm. Okay. I just want to, I want to drop this in here. Uh, listeners, uh, if you would like to uh, talk to tonight's guest, you still have some time. Uh, just dial 516-453-9902. That's 516-453-9902, and we'll take your call. Or if you want to just throw out a comment on uh, or a question on Twitter, just put in hashtag Fresh Ink Group in your tweet, and uh, we'll see it. So if you understand that Cousin uh, Oliver reference, hashtag <laughs> Fresh Ink Group in your tweet and let us know. There you go. So, Michael, you've you've got stories in several anthologies too: ghostly rights, ghostly romance. Uh, I'm yeah. sensing a theme here. Well, uh, some uh, I got into writing the ghost stories uh, basically because of ghostly rights. Uh, uh, a, a person who I knew, uh, Claire Placed it is her name, and she actually lives now in New Zealand. Uh, but she, when I first was introduced to her. Uh, she lived in uh, the UK, but she's native New Zealander, so she went back home, if you will. And she's been public, uh, publishing these um, ghostly rights anthologies for a number of years. 
so I, um, I forget who introduced me to her, but I thought, well, that's fun. I, I like ghost stories, so I'll, I'll try my hand at writing some ghost stories for the anthology. So uh, a lot of the stories in November Tales, some of the stories in November Tales, for argument's sake, were, were from that, for, from the efforts that I did for the anthology. And I also published some of them separately as, as separate works. Uh, so... Um, uh, you know, I do like ghost stories. I find uh, not not just macabre, but you know, sort of the uh, uh, dealing with the supernatural and dealing with the paranormal. Uh, it, first of all, I, I I I like stories like that. Some of them, and I I don't make them too gory or in any way. They they usually have a bit of a of a lighter uh, touch than that. Uh, but I do like the uh, I do like that genre. So I have yeah, I do have a number of of ghost stories out there, and I I, I like them. Yeah. So, so then, from ghostly to cozy, you're writing a murder mystery now for your mom. Well, that's that's the latest thing. That's the work in progress, if you will. Um, so I've I've been working on this since um, last May, kind of through the summer, if you will. And so from from nothing to we're at around forty five or so thousand words, and I'm targeting something around sixty or sixty five thousand. So it's going to be a novel length, but uh, most of the fantasy works were upwards of 110, 120,000 words, so much, you know, twice as large, if you will. And so this is, you know, this particular genre is murder mystery, but it's not the gory kind of dark, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of. Some people write these murder mysteries where everybody's being stabbed every 10 seconds. It's not like that. So I guess closer to the cozy um, uh, genre, but uh, I, I'm trying to. Get some nice strong characters. Um, I like the folks who I've I've put into the into the lead role and the crystal part of it, the cozy crystal part of it, is uh, this is just a little backstory. My wife ran a rock and gem sh- uh, uh, store for oh gosh ten or ten or twelve years, and she loves crystals. And so I'm pulling in some of that because um, I worked in the store with her all the time, you know. So I learned a lot about crystals myself. And about gems and minerals, and I'm pulling some of that in. I'm pulling in some of the, um, uh, you know, some of the the stuff that my my mom was looking for because she likes mysteries. So that's what this this effort is about. And we'll see how it comes out. It is a new genre for me. Um, although I did, as a ch- you know, as a young person, like reading, uh, you know, like the Hardy Boys and Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes and those kinds of. And I would I would say that those kinds of mysteries, detective and and murder mystery uh, novels, are, are are in the background of this one too, as far as as inspirations. Well, let's hope she likes it because I hear mom can be a brutal critic. <laughs> mom, mom is mom is, uh, is 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 definitely a good critic. She's uh, you know she's. Um, I always let her read whatever I've written before it's public, published because she has a good good take on things, being an English major. And she writes a lot, too, and never publish. I try to encourage her to publish things, but she doesn't want to publish anything. But she's a good writer as well. So, yeah, Mom definitely get a chance to, to critique this before it goes to press. So how do you publish? Do you self-publish? you work with publishers? Exactly. All of the above? I, I, done both um the my editor the first the, the novel uh, sorry the, the the narrative nonfiction there's reaper was published um uh, by uh, Barry Shankup he has he had a little publishing uh house uh which uh, published the novel and um uh, that was also where we went and had um the fat man published so those two were both done uh, through through Barry's uh, publishing publishing house but then since that time since I found sort of figured out the ropes I, I uh, have done all the other things that I've done as self-published um, works. Uh, I use Draft to Digital uh, for formatting, and they do a, a really wonderful job. And then I'll publish it. You know, uh, I, I do always publish wide. I, I don't pick Amazon or do any of their um, sort of their, uh, uh, you know, um, what do they call it? Um, you, 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 you're, 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 you're tied into Amazon's uh, publishing, um, Kindle Select or Direct or whatever the heck they call it. Uh, I don't do that, but I'll, I publish as a Kindle, you know, as Kindle work as well as um, uh, paperback and audio book. Nothing in hardcover because I, I, I just I don't I don't think the uh, for what I do that the the, the return on investment is there, uh, but everything in in either soft cover or um, or ebook. Hmm. So and where do you get your do, covers? 
Uh, the covers are interesting. Um, almost all the covers that I've done for the early stuff for Christopher's book and for um, uh, for uh, the Fat Man, I found a very good cover artist. Her name is Sam- Samantha McLaughlin. And she's actually a friend of one of my of one of my sons, and uh, she's, she's a very good artist. But then the the layout. Uh, for those two books uh, was done by the, the publisher. So, you know, the fonts and, and all uh, were, were selected. And then since that time, everything else, again, I'll, the uh, covers, I'll either design them myself. I think I've designed almost all the covers of everything since that time. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, picking the fonts, picking the, the, um, uh, uh, the cover, pla- you know, the picture placement, and so on. A lot of those pictures are uh, either I took the pictures myself, or they're you know I'll, I'll license a picture, I'll license a, a cover picture, and um, I think it's it's not they're not too bad. I'm not a I'm not a terrific cover designer, but I'm I'm not the worst one ever either. <laughs> <laughs> now you and so, your, you, know, like, your, you and your wife you you do a radio show as well. So what's we do, this all yes. about? Well, uh, that's um, uh, we've been doing a radio show for um, about four years now. It's called The Soul of the Everyman, uh, and it, it actually was uh, serendipitous. I had had a, a, a one of these uh, again, a sort of an author show interview uh, with a, a gentleman by the name of um, of uh, Scott, who was uh, was the uh, uh, the host that evening, and he worked for a place called Artist First Radio. Artist First Radio does uh, bands, and they do um, authors, and they do talk shows. And they have all kinds of shows on that particular radio station. It's uh, it's live, it's broadcast live, and then it's archived. So it's similar to what what, you, what you're doing with your with FIG, uh, in some respects. Different. Everyone has their own spin on it. So after that interview, uh, he said, would you like to do your own radio show? I'm like, well, you know, I thought to myself, well, no, not really. Because, <laughs> you know, it's just, I had no idea what, how if I could fill even 10 minutes of, of time. But yet, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we sat down, talked about it, talked to Margaret about it. said, do you want to do a radio show? Because I want to do it with you. I don't want to just sit, sit there and do a, a monologue diatribe kind of thing. Because I don't think those those are well. I wanted to have a conversation. And and so what we were, we what we crafted this about was basically when we were working in the rock and jam together, Margaret and I would talk to each other all the time about whatever, and people would come in and we'd have conversations. And what we always noticed is that we would everyone else in the store would stop and listen to us talking about whatever we were talking about to whomever we were talking about it to. And so we said, well, let's just have a conversation between you and I about whomever. Either we'll have a guest or it'll just be you and I talking about a particular topic. So that's what the show became. Uh, we pick a topic and we talk about it for an hour. And um, it's been very well received. Uh, we have a lot of listeners and a lot of people listen to the show um, you know, afterwards, as you guys were mentioning about you know, uh, in the archives. And so now uh, on Artist First, if you go to our website, uh, you know, our, our Artist First page, we have, uh, you know, four years worth of weekly shows, hours long, so an hour long each time. So we have this ridiculous number of hours, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of us talking on the radio. It's really kind of ridiculous, <laughs> but we enjoy so, it. So, so what's uh, this, and people do, where, where's do this website at? Oh, uh, you know, I should probably give it, but it's 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 um yeah. Give me a second. I'll just give it to you exactly. Uh, since I'm si- sitting right in front of the computer, uh, it's um, artist first without any s. So it's a r t i s t f i r s t no no space dot com slash lines, which is my name l y n e s uh, dot h t m. So you just type that in, and and you'll you can come to the page. We have I have some of my books there. And then we have all the shows, and it just goes on and on and on. But but they're very they're also on YouTube. Uh, we have them all posted on YouTube and on Rumble and a couple other of these uh, venues, uh, you know, where you can do videos. But they're really just audio shows with a with a um, a picture, you know, that we are talking to. And the picture is usually the, a picture of the topic, if you will, a, a picture that that is sort of encapsulates the topic, a quote or whatever it is that we happen to be talking about for that show. And they've been very well received. We we've had a lot of fun with it. All right, cool. I'll have to check that yeah. out. Yeah, um, they're fun. Uh, uh, you were Stephen. You said philosophy, and the first, these are philosophical. A lot of these are philosophical. Hmm, okay. 
So speaking of philosophy, do you have any advice for authors out there in the audience? Well, I, I would say or, <laughs> or musicians. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I have no talent in music whatsoever, so I wouldn't, wouldn't presume. But certainly for, for authors, I would say uh, the, the, the main thing is, is keep writing. And, you know, they always say write about what you know, and I would say write about what you, what you like. Uh, I've learned a lot. You know, when you start researching for a story, uh, you should do you know you do a little research and you learn something about um, the 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 environs, about the character, about about yourself. And so, part of of writing is also the researching part. I, I'm not a huge researcher, but I do enjoy learning. Like I learned a lot about Japanese culture. And I wrote a different, another different short story um, uh, that was based on Japanese culture, just because I had done so much research for it uh, for the Blood series. <laughs> so it's fun. Hmm. Yeah, Japanese culture. Um, Ron Yates, one of our previous guests, he spent a lot of time over there, and uh, I, he's got a lot of interesting stories, you know, with with that that culture over there. Um, oh how yeah, can, uh, I know Ron. I, 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 yeah. I met him uh, years ago too. Yeah, I, I know Ron Yates. I've spoken to him a couple, three times. He's he's a, he's a he's a very interesting character. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, uh, how can people contact you? How can they find you? Uh, social media, blog site, blog uh, website, Instagram, sure. Facebook, um, Twitter. Yeah, we're on all those. Um, you know, uh, my handle in almost everything is Wood Heat uh, because we do heat our house with wood. So that's where that comes from. Uh, so it's called Wood Heat, and um, and so on Instagram, it's uh, I think Wood Heat was taken, so it's called Wood Heat Angel. On Twitter, it's Wood Heat, uh, and um, on uh, I don't, what else am I on? Uh, but Wood Heat is the handle, and uh, uh, we do have a I do have a, a website, which we host on. Um, let's see, it's on Wix, so it's MikeLyons.wixsite.com m lyons author uh and we have all the books there as well as links to all the other you know the the radio show and and the short stories and it just you know you know so you guys know the social media can just consume your life i've actually backed away quite a bit from it over the last couple of years because it was just too too much i wasn't getting anything else done uh, yeah so I, 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 I feel I, you I there say that the social media Right, uh, so I, I wouldn't say the social media is is as up to date, but you certainly people certainly can can get to us there, uh, you know, uh, um, there a, a, as well on the websites and on social media. This is why we hired a guy to do it for us there at Fresh Ink. Yeah. <laughs> he's a whiz out there. He gets out there and just because I mean, you get bogged Wilson, down in doing that, 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 you don't have time to do anything else. Yeah, is is, is that Samuel? I, I think I, I interacted yeah. Yeah. with him a little bit. Yeah, he, he's very yeah, nice you know fellow. Yeah, and the thing is, is you know, you you and your son uh, work on the German autos. Uh, he's big into Sam is big into what is it, Volvo, Stephen? Volvo, yeah. 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 And somebody, he somebody just gave him things. a Honda with four hundred thousand miles on it that he's restoring too. Oh, there you go. That's, and he rolls up his sleeves and gets into it, you know. Yeah, well, we have that in common then too. I I I had a, a brief you know email exchange with Sam uh, when I was I think I was handing him an excerpt and the bio and things that sort of stuff. He seems seems like a very nice kid. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's been fun having you on the show, Michael. It's been a long time yeah. since we've talked, and uh, I'm glad that we got to talk about your books and 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 hear about your radio show and all this kind of stuff. We'd like to invite you to. Join us on future podcasts. We'd like to have you back again as a guest someday, but feel free to listen in, call in, harass our, our other guests in future weeks, too. And that's true of all of you guests on the on the uh, Voice of Indie podcast. You're encouraged to keep coming back, participate, spread the word, and get things out there. We've, we've also got it's to... Been a... Go ahead. It's been my pleasure. It's been fun. Yeah. We have a uh, cover for Whoopi Likes Her Bacon Crispy now. So everybody look real quick. I'm going to hold it up. This is the cover reveal. Is that cool or what? <laughs> oh, yeah. you can't see it? <laughs> well, maybe maybe it'll be in next week's newsletter. And if you want to make sure you, you see that, get to freshinkgroup.com and down near the bottom of the home page, fill out the little form so that you can get on our mailing list, learn about these podcasts, see, see things like the sample of uh, Michael Lyons' work that was in today's newsletter. Yeah. 
Of course. And then you'll also find out who next week's guest is. That's Tammy Trollberg, the author of The ABCs of Surviving Cancer, Alive, Beautiful, and Courageous with Cornelius the Cancer-Fighting Crocodile. This is a beautifully illustrated book for families, children, friends, and neighbors. And uh, Tammy will be on the air uh, talking about her journey. Uh, and uh, it'll be your opportunity to call her up and share your own stories or have, if you have questions for her. So give her a call and tune in next week. Yep. Now, the week after that, uh, I'm going to be in Michigan for a couple of days and then over to Chicago, and I'm bringing Mr. Weeks, our co-host, back to Alabama this time. So we're traveling on Wednesday, which means that we're going to do a short little quick bumper show and replay the interview that we did with each other about seven or eight months ago. So two weeks from now, it'll be mostly rerun, so we won't be taking live calls or monitoring Twitter during the show. But we encourage you to check in and learn a little bit about your co-hosts and their books. And then after that? After that, uh, the following week is author Patty Wiseman. Uh, Patty is a multi-genre author. She's written, uh, I believe, children's books. She's written uh, romance and mystery. And uh, she's got quite a few books out there. So if you want to get to know a little bit about her before that episode, go over to Amazon or go over to freshinggroup.com and under the members page you'll find Patty Wiseman and go take a look and see what she's all about and then tune in. Hmm. So thanks again to everybody for participating and especially Michael Lines, uh, extraordinary author. We appreciate you being on the show, Michael. Thanks for joining well, thank us. Thank you Michael. very much, guys. It was fun. All right, thanks. And we'll see everybody we next week. All right, everybody, and remember, check out the show in the uh, archive and uh, help us get those numbers bouncing. Bye, everybody. Bye. You've been a part of Voice of Indy, a production of Fresh Ink Group. Spread the word, support our guests, then find us at freshinkgroup.com and be sure to hashtag Fresh Ink Group.